and we're live. All right, hello everybody. I'm Jalal Difala. I am part of the uh, research team at the Wikimedia Foundation. So I will be your host for today's uh, March 2020 research showcase, a very special one uh, due to all the circumstances. And uh, I will be also being helped by Jonathan Morgan, who will be uh, running the uh, uh, IRC and YouTube channels. So please uh, send your messages and comments and also questions through that channel if you are there. Uh, so the theme of today's uh, is essentially topic models. Uh, so from a high level, this is the work of essentially discovering automatically using machine learning and statistics, uh, groups of documents that share like common topics uh, and how we can autom automatically mine them and classify them as well. I will leave the task of presenting exactly what this means to for Wikipedia to Isaac Johnson, who is also part of the research team, who will be presenting some of the work that we are doing uh, in that domain during the second part of that showcase. But in the first part, uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Jordan uh, Floyd Grapper, uh, who is from is a professor from University of Maryland and currently doing a sabbatical at uh, Google Zurich, and. Uh, Jordan will be talking about uh, essentially uh, talk on big data analysis with topic models, evaluation, interaction, and multilingual extensions. So really looking forward to uh, his talk. And with that, Jordan, uh, the floor is yours. OK, uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, this is very much uh, my uh, University of Maryland hat. So. Uh, uh, this is 100% uh, speaking as a professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, even though I am in Zurich at the moment, uh, although I'm in uh, my apartment uh, because of uh, the interesting circumstances uh, that, that were previously mentioned. Uh, so uh, let me uh, get in. I'm going to talk about several things. And because this is um, a virtual room, as it were, I'll try to stop after each subsection just to make sure that I haven't been cut off. And, and also to see if uh, there are any uh, clarification questions that uh, I can answer at the end of each section. Um, and hopefully at the end, we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions as well. So um, let me first try to set the stage a little bit and motivate why we're talking about topics. Uh, so first, it, it goes without saying that uh, we're living in the age of big data. And so every second, there are uh, hundreds of new blog posts, uh, tens of thousands of tweets, and gigabytes of data uploaded to Facebook. And, and much of this text is in the form of raw text. And uh, a major challenge is uh, to understand what's going on in this. And you don't have XML or semantic web markup to tell you what this means. You need to figure out what's in these texts just from the raw words in these documents. And there are many people who have this challenge. Uh, so analysts uh, working at three-letter agencies trying to understand what's going on in the world. Uh, companies who want to know, are my products making people happy or unhappy? And if so, why? Uh, journalists trying to understand, is there a new story breaking somewhere in the world? And if so, what's going on? What's behind the story? And um, it's not just breaking news. Uh, humanists also have this problem as well. If uh, you have as the subject of your PhD, the works of some author who published a book every six months, uh, you in the course of your PhD can't read all of those books. Uh, you need some way to do what's called this distant reading to try to understand what's going on. And one common approach that gets used is a form of unsupervised machine learning uh, called topic modeling. And uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. In contrast to what uh, will be uh, later on today, uh, where you're doing topic classification, where you know in advance what you're looking for, uh, so finding a needle in a haystack, this is more trying to answer the question, what the heck is in my haystack? OK, so let me talk about uh, topic models from a very high level just as a black box. Uh, so in a topic model, uh, you take in a corpus, a bunch of documents as input, and some integer k. Uh, and let's say, for the sake of uh, concreteness, that you're looking at all of the articles in a major US newspaper over the course of a decade. And you want to figure out what are the k most talked about things in that collection. 
And so if you do this on uh, the New York Times in the 90s, uh, and you say, give me the 50 most talked about things, uh, three of the topics that you get out are uh, technology, uh, business, and entertainment. Uh, this isn't all that you get out. Uh, we'll talk about the other uh, connection uh, between documents and these topics in a second. But first, I, I want to emphasize that this is unsupervised machine learning. Uh, the computer just knows that this is topic one, topic two, topic three. Uh, I am imparting my own label to these topics. Uh, you just get a list of words out. OK, so now that we know that uh, these are three of the 50 most talked about things in uh, the New York Times, uh, you can now associate individual documents to these topics. So red light, green light, a two-tone LED to simplify strings, uh, screens, uh, sorry, is all about the technology topic. The three big internet portals begin to distinguish among themselves as shopping malls, uh, combines technology and business, and forget the bootleg, just download the movie legally, combines all three of these topics. And so you can look at these descriptions of topics at a high level. Uh, you can find out which of these are interesting to you, and then you can start drilling down into the documents that are relevant to the topics of interest. Now, uh, Topic models have been used a lot. Uh, uh, Late and Dirichlet allocation, the original publication from uh, my advisor, Dave Bly, is uh, the most cited uh, paper in computer science. Uh, so it's been used a lot. And uh, one thing that I've been very active in is trying to figure out, once you have these models, how do you know whether the topic analysis is good or not? And there are many ways that you can do this analysis. Um, one thing that we proposed is actually showing it to people and asking them, does the topic make sense? And so the way that we do this is we take the output of some model and then we stick in some other word into that set. And then we ask a human if they can detect the word that we uh, put in. And we call this word the intruder word. And uh, our hypothesis is that if a topic is good, then users will be able to consistently find the intruder word that we put in. And so if you do this uh, systematically, you can now get uh, a characterization of what makes for a good topic, say on the right here, uh, artist exhibition, gallery, museum, painting. Uh, that, according to this analysis, is a very good topic. And you move to the left, you get worse and worse topics. And we call this a model precision. How often can a user find the words that we stick in? And I'm not going to talk about the traditional way of evaluating topic models that was uh, prevalent before we uh, suggested this new approach. Um, this is called uh, held out likelihood. You might've heard about this in perplexity. Uh, these are similar analyses. Uh, but uh, the, the moral of the story is that uh, human understanding is negatively correlated with this traditional measurement. So the lines are going uh, down and to the right. And so in the common range of models that you actually see in practice, uh, optimizing perplexity doesn't give you uh, models that humans can understand. OK, uh, so that is my first uh, uh, subsection. And before I move on to uh, how you can fix models that go bad, uh, I want to pause here. And are there any clarification questions? And uh, are all the AVs uh, working well? Go for it, George. OK, all right, fantastic. Um, OK, so uh, let me next talk about interactive topic modeling. So let's say that you've run a topic model analysis and you find some topics that you don't like. Uh, the previous part that we talked about explained how you could fix, uh, sorry, how you could detect some of those problems. And now uh, we're going to talk about how you can fix them. OK, so uh, at a high level, what we're going to do is we're going to take some topic analysis. And this is, again, from the New York Times data set. And uh, let's say that you have 20 topics here. And a user comes to you and says, uh, topic one is about the Russian Federation. Topic 20 is about the Soviet Union. This is really part of the same historical narrative. Um, this analysis doesn't make sense to me. I want these things to be together. And uh, before uh, my student Yining uh, did this uh, really nice approach, uh, topic modeling was basic basically a take it or leave it proposition. You could do a topic analysis, you got some output, and if you didn't like it, tough luck. 
Uh, maybe if you had a PhD in computer science, you could create a new model, uh, but the people using topic models uh, don't necessarily have that background. So uh, what uh, my student uh, uh, helped work on is to create a way that you could combine these two topics together. Um, and so you could tell the model, hey, I want these words, uh, Boris Yeltsin, Mikhail Gorbachev, they should all be merged together into a single topic. And then you give that feedback and lo and behold, topic 20 uh, uh, becomes now about the uh, Russian Federation and the Soviet Union. And topic one, which used to be about an emerging democracy in the Russian Federation is now about uh, democratic movements elsewhere. And uh, topics two through 19 that you were sensibly happy with uh, remain uh, basically unchanged. And so uh, you don't have to start from scratch. You can give feedback uh, to these models. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the underlying uh, uh, details here. Um, if uh, there are links to the, the papers in the uh, metadata. And, uh, but the, the basic background is that we're using a different prior to our models, since these are all probabilistic models, and those priors encode uh, the human background knowledge. And so we also did a collaboration with the National Institute of Health in the United States, uh, where uh, they wanted to uh, have an analysis of some of the grants that they were funding. And uh, pesky topic 318 out of a 700 topic model was the one that they were most un unsatisfied with. The other topics looked pretty good and they were relatively happy, but this one topic uh, made them say, ah, no, this topic modeling stuff just doesn't work. So we're able to add in an additional constraint uh, to split out uh, the uh, neural words in blue from the um, uh, urinary words in red. And uh, then uh, topic number 318 now looks quite a bit better. Uh, uh, it's mostly about the neural uh, component and neurothelial, which apparently is also a nerve uh, connected to the bladder, uh, remains and, and that's okay. And so we're able to fix this model and the other 699 topics uh, are still okay. Okay, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is how to make uh, these interactive models both fast and multilingual. And uh, this is uh, work uh, uh, by uh, my other student, Michelle. And so uh, before I move on, uh, I just want to pause if there are any clarification questions um, and to confirm that people are still hearing me. All good. OK, all right. Uh, so I'll press on then. So. Uh, not all data are in a single language, uh, for example, English. And, uh, and oftentimes, uh, you have uh, surprise uh, events that emerge. Uh, so it could be uh, a pandemic, uh, it could be a, an earthquake. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, you then have this very urgent need to understand what people are talking about in languages where you don't have a lot of NLP experience. And uh, you need to analyze these large collections in uh, uh, hours, uh, or if not minutes. And uh, the traditional approaches for doing this uh, based on probabilistic models uh, are, are typically quite slow and, and require hours. And uh, particularly if you want to add interactivity, that's just not fast enough. And so uh, another thing that we've worked on is how to make these topic analyses both interactive and fast. Um, before I get into uh, some of the intuition behind this, uh, let me talk about the motivation a little bit more. So let's say that you have a multilingual uh, collection. You want to have topics that make sense across those languages. So you, you want an agriculture topic that makes sense in both, say, English and Chinese, uh, and a business topic that makes sense in both English and Chinese. And you should be able to connect individual words to those topics and uh, even within a document, find out what parts of the document are talking about each of these topics. So uh, what we're going to use to solve this problem is a technique called anchor word analysis. And uh, this comes out of some ideas from theoretical computer science um, based on uh, uh, matrix factorization. 
And what we want to do is we want to find words that appear with high probability in one topic, but low probability in all other topics. So if you see this particular word, you know that this document will talk about a particular topic. And uh, this is kind of the reverse of the traditional topic modeling problem, where you're trying to find a probability of a word given a topic, uh, but we can use Bayes' rule to flip around the conditionality. So, it's uh, often easy to think about this geometrically. And so uh, oftentimes these anchor words are uh, weird words. Uh, and uh, you, they're, they're often very specific to a topic. Uh, but if you see carburetor, uh, you know that you're talking about an automotive topic. And if you see concealer, you know that you're talking about a cosmetics topic. Uh, and these words are, are kind of the uh, a signal that you're talking about a topic, even though they're not very descriptive words. And what we can do is to describe the co-occurrence pattern of a particular word. Uh, we can combine these anchor word co-occurrence uh, distributions together. So what's a co-occurrence distribution? That's just the probability of seeing uh, one word, given that you've seen some other word. And for these anchor words, these will look a lot like topics. So if you look at what are the other words that co-occur with concealer, you'll th see things like makeup or rouge or foundation, and that will look a lot like the topics that you want to uncover. So uh, for an ambiguous word like liner that can appear in uh, each of these three different uh, topics, uh, the co-occurrence uh, properties of liner uh, look a lot like the combination of uh, carburetor, album, and concealers, uh, co-occurrence words. Okay, so uh, this now turns the problem of finding a topic model into finding these anchor words. And once you find those anchor words, uh, everything is really fast afterwards. And so this runs in a matter of uh, minutes uh, rather than hours. And so uh, I have equations here that we can go back to if there are equations. Uh, I won't talk about it here to keep this at a high level. Uh, and uh, that's how this works monolingually. Um, but uh, now let's talk about this uh, multilingually. So uh, if you think about the problem of finding anchor words geometrically, this is uh, finding a bunch of words in some space, and you want to explain as much of the data as possible. So you want to uh, have a uh, set uh, of anchor words that covers as much of the space as possible. So you want the, uh, if the anchor words are the black dots, you want the white triangle to be as big as possible. So uh, we could make uh, this white triangle bigger by adding some more points. We could add the words forest and bourgeoisie, and uh, in computational geometry, this is a problem called finding the convex hull. So we could expand this out and explain more of the data. So that's the intuition. And uh, these anchor words are often bad topics once you find them. They, they lead to bad topics. You could get duplicate topics uh, or, or just bad topics, uh, overly specific or ambiguous. And so we need this interactivity that I talked about before. And so we're going to uh, allow users to change the anchor words and thus change the underlying topics. Uh, the nice thing about this is that because it's working this anchor words formalism, it's still very, very fast. And so uh, now let's do this multilingually. Uh, we're now going to say that the anchor words are going to be uh, pairs of anchor words across two different languages. And uh, let's see what this looks like in terms of a picture. So uh, we can link up words with translations. These translations can be provided by a user or by a dictionary. And now we need to expand this convex whole uh, like we talked about before. But instead of doing it monolingually, where we're just trying to change uh, the set of anchor words to make one of these uh, sets larger, we want to try to explain both languages simultaneously. So now as we grow this convex whole set, um, we're not going to include bourgeoisie because it doesn't have a translation. So it doesn't expand the Chinese uh, convex whole. It just expands the English one. So we're not going to use it. 
Um, but uh, the uh, uh, the word datu uh, hui is uh, very close to the English convex hull. Uh, and so even though the Chinese uh, equivalent over here is uh, very far away from the Chinese set, uh, adding this pair doesn't give you as much. But instead, what we'll do uh, is we'll look at uh, what pair of words expands us the most. And uh, so in this case, forest and senlin um, do expand the convex hole the most. So we will add that to the set. And uh, that gives us the best expansion of what we can explain. And so uh, now uh, we can make this interactive. We can show this to a user and uh, we'll select anchor words uh, such that the, uh, the pair of uh, explanations are maximal. And so uh, we could have problems uh, in both the dictionary and in the alignments. And so here, this is where humans can come in and, and help refine uh, the underlying analysis. So Michelle built this great interface uh, to uh, allow people to add and remove words across these languages. They, they can create new topics. And uh, we did a bunch of experiments uh, in both Chinese and low resource languages. We measure how well you can do classification in a supervised way, like what we'll hear about in a second, um, based on this unsupervised analysis using those as features. And uh, uh, we compared to uh, existing approaches and uh, for most languages, our technique is better. Uh, for a uh, for very rare languages, an existing approach MCTA is uh, a little bit better. Uh, but the takeaway is that uh, we're much much faster. Uh, so we basically find the answer in a matter of uh, seconds, uh, whereas MCTA uh, takes much much longer to even get uh, its first answer. And uh, as we uh, show this to humans, uh, uh, the humans can improve this quite a bit. Uh, of course, not all uh, users are equal. Uh, so uh, some users make it better. Uh, some users uh, make it a little bit worse. Uh, but the, on average, the trend is improving. Um, and uh, one question that I often get when I present this work is, why don't you use deep learning? And uh, uh, one answer to that is that neural networks are uh, pretty data hungry and unsupervised unsuitable for low resource languages. And uh, deep learning models take a really long amount of time to train. And uh, once you show them to a user, uh, they're hard to understand what's going on. So uh, not only is it uh, a slower, uh, harder to understand, but there really isn't an easy way for users to then go in and to fix the models. And by anchoring them, no pun intended, to these anchor words, uh, we can uh, make that process uh, more friendly to human users. Okay, um, uh, I think uh, I will wrap up here. Uh, and, oh, I went into my extra slides. Okay, hold on. All right, there we go. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and uh, there are other things uh, that we're working on. Uh, we're trying to um, uh, add this interactivity in downstream applications where, say, you're trying to do the classification tasks uh, uh, that we'll hear about in a second. Uh, we're, we're trying to use these interactive settings to measure how good uh, we're doing at explaining what models are doing. And uh, so I want to live in a future where it's not that uh, uh, machines have stolen all of our jobs, uh, but where humans and machines can work together. And can we actually measure uh, how well humans and machines work together uh, and use that to choose which machine learning models and which machine learning explanations uh, we're using. And uh, at a linguistic level, we're also trying to uh, use uh, morphology and other low-level aspects of languages to get better representations. And uh, I talked about how to explicitly evaluate the quality of topics in a single language, doing that multilingually is a lot more of a challenge when you have these linked topics. And so uh, one thing that I would love to get feedback on or suggestions is how to do the intrusion analysis uh, effectively across languages. 
So uh, with that, uh, I will thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, thank my collaborators and uh, funders. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jordan. I, yeah. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, do you have some questions, Jonathan, coming from IRC or YouTube? I have one of each, actually. Um, Marshall Miller, <coughs> pardon me, I do not have coronavirus. I'm sheltering in place. I just ate a pretzel, I swear. Um, Marshall Miller asks on YouTube, what is a low resource language? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. A, a low resource language is a language um, for which you don't have a lot of resources. And so that begs the question of uh, what's a, a resource. And so uh, one way of uh, characterizing how many resources you have is how many open source projects you have out there uh, that you could just run straight out of the box uh, on that language. So for English, for French, for Arabic, for Russian, for Chinese, uh, there are a lot of resources you could download uh, to use for language. But um, if uh, you're thinking about like Haitian Creole, uh, that language isn't studied as much. There are fewer written documents. Um, uh, specifically in the context of Wikipedia, uh, there are fewer Wikipedia pages for low resource languages. So it's just harder to do uh, the things that you're used to doing in high resource languages. And a big problem in natural language processing right now is to break the habits of thinking, well, if it works on English, it will work on everything else. And that often isn't true for low resource languages. And we need to be skeptical uh, that the approaches that we use for one language will uh, uh, generalize to all other languages. Thank you. I just put another pretzel in my mouth. That was a, that was bad timing on my part. We have one more question um, from uh, Aaron Hafiger on IOC. The question is a two-parter. What would word embeddings add to this strategy would capturing the semantic relatedness of the anchor words give users more flexibility or power? Okay, uh, that is a fantastic question. So uh, uh, perhaps, um, and so uh, 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 Moonte Lee and David Nimno have uh, addressed this question more directly. And so um, uh, they're, they're great researchers at Cornell and, and they've looked at exactly this problem. And uh, often using word embeddings can help. Um, one downside is that uh, then you need to have word embeddings and having good word embeddings often requires you to have a lot of data in the language. So um, in the case of uh, we're interested in uh, focusing on low resource languages, we often don't have that. Um, either because we don't have time to tune a good word embedding model, or we just don't have enough text to generate the word embedding model. Um, so it can help. It doesn't always help. And uh, one, one reason that even in high resource languages that it doesn't always help is that if you have very morphologically rich languages, word embeddings can get a little bit confused. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, it can help, uh, but not always. And uh, particularly for low resources, you may not have them. Great question. Awesome. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, so we have one, uh, one question uh, coming from YouTube um, from Grocery Heist. Uh, I'm curious about using these semi-supervised approaches along with structural topic modeling where you're interested in studying covariation between topic and document level variables. Any thoughts about work on that sort of thing? And I can repeat that question if you'd like. Uh, 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 so I, I think I got it. Uh, so uh, uh, let me explain for uh, uh, anyone else uh, about the, the structured topic models. And so uh, structured topic models are uh, an example of a broader class of topic models called supervised topic models, where um, you're not just doing this unsupervised analysis. Hey, I have a bunch of documents. Tell me what's going on in this document collection. You also want to know um, what are Republicans talking about uh, versus what Democrats are talking about, or um, uh, 
what topics are used in positive uh, reviews of Amazon products versus negative reviews of Amazon products. So you want to see some sort of connection between the topics and some other variable that you're interested in. Um, and so the structured topic model is one way to do that. Um, uh, so I will answer the question more generally about supervised topic models uh, rather than focus on the uh, one specific instance. Uh, so yes, absolutely. And, and, and this is something that um, this student right here, Viet An Nguyen, uh, looked at quite a bit uh, during his PhD. Uh, and so um, what I think is really interested about, uh, interesting about this is that um, adding these uh, covariates can lead to very different topics. And if you do this in a multilingual setting, you can often discover uh, interesting connections between languages. And so, for example, if you're doing sentiment, uh, uh, sorry, sentiment analysis um, across languages, and, and languages are often tied to cultures, you can discover the very different ways that people dislike, uh, say, a product. And so uh, if you're looking at, say, reviews of um, uh, wireless routers uh, uh, in English. Uh, topics that correlate with bad reviews talk about customer service and uh, uh, how the customer service is unfriendly and it was hard to set up and stuff like that. But if you look at uh, the reviews in German, the German reviews complain about, well, I can't install um, uh, 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 DDWRT and, and stuff like that. And so you, you discover these interesting connections um, uh, about how people express themselves differently. And doing this across languages can reveal differences uh, in how these correlates uh, combine with uh, topics. And uh, you can use that as an additional uh, level of analysis, just like you do um, monolingually, but multilingually, uh, it becomes far more interesting. Thank you. Um, Jalel, do we have time for another question? I'm going to assume so. Uh, Jared, uh, you're, you're muted. I think you were. Um, yeah, we, we do have. Go, go, okay. go ahead, John. Cool. Um, so this question is from uh, uh, Eli Askin Garmager. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, just more generally, wondering how you're thinking about building morphological analysis into your work, if you'd like to talk more about that. Yeah, so um, uh, there, there are a couple of ways that we're thinking about, and um, uh, I, I have no idea what the right way is. So we're still in sort of the generate ideas, try them out, see what works. Um, uh, one thing that um, we're looking at is um, probably th the obvious thing that, that anyone would think of is, is just building equivalence sets. And so you can run a uh, unsupervised morphological analysis on a language like Morfessor um, uh, or things like that. And then anything that has the same stem, you clump them together and you, you call that a word. So like that's the stupidest thing you could do, but it, it actually does seem to help quite a bit. Um, a, a more complicated way, and so this is work uh, that uh, a student at the University of Colorado is looking at, is trying to build a graph. And so you have all of these words and you can build edges between them if they co-occur together or if they're morphologically similar. And uh, instead of just say, treating these words as points in some nebulous space, you, you now have edges between them and those edges give you some additional information and you try to have topics uh, or uh, uh, clusters of words that respect the topology of the network as well as putting cl points close together. Um, and, and then there are some more complicated things you could do with like using uh, RNNs or LSTMs to generate a representation of a word based on say the character sequence. Uh, and then also thinking uh, carefully about how you construct those character sequences, uh, particularly for languages like Japanese, where uh, uh, the vocabulary of the characters is uh, more interesting. Awesome. All right. Do you have some more questions, Jonathan? We had one comment that I want to share. Um, yeah, go ahead. 
so a comment from uh, Andy Mabbitt, um, who suggests uh, there's no topic classification article on English Wikipedia. Maybe Jordan and his, and his students would like to write one. Um, and and I wanted to contextualize this. I, I believe that you know I believe that this that this suggestion is being is being made in, is, as a form of a compliment because you do, you've done an incredibly good job of explaining a, a complex scientific topic to a lay audience. So um, so take that take that suggestion um, uh, enthusiastically uh, yes, and reach out uh, and reach you. out if you want help. Um, any uh, of us are, yeah, are happy to help. And you. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, one thing that you, you can look at is a Leighton Dirichlet allocation article. So like mm -hmm. that, that is uh, uh, an inaccessible uh, title, uh, but uh, that page is relatively good. I have edited that in the past. Uh, and so uh, uh, that's a good place to look. And, and uh, at the risk of self-promotion, um, uh, Linked is a, a book on applications of topic models that I wrote with David Mindo and Yining Hu. Um, and uh, the first chapter, we try to give uh, an introduction to the stuff. Uh, and uh, the book isn't that old yet, so it's not horribly out of date. Uh, so that would be another place uh, people could look if they wanted an introduction. I think that's a fair plug. Um, anyone who, who doesn't know how to spell Dirichlet, just go to uh, type LDA into the search bar, and it is one of the results under there. That'll get you the article. And I think that's all we have for questions and comments on Jordan's talk. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much. These, these were great questions. Totally are on mute. Let's transition to room questions. Uh, I think we have another four, even five minutes potentially uh, to take questions from the research team. I have uh, two questions actually. Um, the first one I think is pretty quick, but at the end of the talk, you said one of the things you're interesting, interested in kind of uh, picking apart is how to do intrusion analysis for multilingual and I wasn't familiar with uh, intrusion analysis so I just was interested in some clarification there. Yeah and and so uh, 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 yeah so uh, if you have a, a, a multilingual topic uh, what does it mean for intruder word uh, uh, in, in this context. And so uh, we, we have uh, multilingual topics and you have a, a list of words in English, a list of words in Chinese, and you stick in another word. Um, what does it mean for that to be an intruder? So uh, should it be an intruder based on uh, the individual Chinese words, the, uh, the English words? Um, if it has a relationship to only the English words, but not the Chinese words, is that a is that an intruder? And so uh, you, you can get to sort of pathologies where you can have independently very coherent topics in English and Chinese uh, that, that, that aren't connected to each other. And so there, there's an additional dimension. Not only do you want topics to make sense, uh, you, you want the alignment to make sense as well. Um, and so just from setting up the task, it's a little bit more complicated um, and then uh, you very quickly limit uh, the population of humans that you can ask this question to because you want people who uh, understand both languages because you don't want to rely on translation because that introduces a, another failure mode. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh, so all of these considerations make the, the problem of knowing whether topics are useful to humans uh, more challenging in this multilingual case. And um, this even gets trickier if you're looking at low resource languages, because many of the things that you would like to do uh, based on high resource languages, like looking at uh, do the words appear together uh, in translations, you, you can't do because you don't have enough translations. And uh, for some languages, the only parallel document you have is the Bible, but the Bible uh, was written uh, using archaic, archaic languages. Uh, not all topics are considered. And so uh, that introduces even more problems. And so uh, we, we have one very early paper from uh, 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 NACL a couple of years ago from Xu Dong Hao that, that tries to address these problems, but uh, we, we certainly don't have an answer. And uh, I, I would love to hear from anyone who has suggestions on how to know whether topics make sense across languages. 
All right. Um, thank you. That that helped clarify. Um, the second one I have is I don't think I need an answer right now, but it's kind of uh, my attempt to bridge what you've been presenting and, and what I'm going to present. Um, so one of the use cases that we've discussed uh, for kind of topics in the relationship to Wikipedia um, is you might imagine that we build kind of a general topic model, um, say for English Wikipedia, um, and then we want to have uh, you know an inter interactive version of this where a user can come in um, and say, you know, say they're interested in something pretty specific like Nigerian artists. They want articles related to Nigerian artists. Um, so they do some kind of tweaking of this topic model to focus in on that specific topic and kind of pick that apart. Um, and then say, you know, so now they've got a list of articles in English about Nigerian art or that have, you know, high relevance to this topic of Nigerian artists. And then they're interested in bringing that into Igbo or, a, you know, a language uh, kind of specific Nigeria where maybe some of those articles exist, uh, maybe some of them don't. There's going to be other articles that weren't in English that probably are related to topic. And so thinking about how they can then kind of tweak that in the new language. So that's kind of the a, a example workflow, I think, that touches on some of your work that I'd be, um, uh, you know, after the presentation, maybe, but ve very curious to hear what some of your thoughts are about the big challenges there and maybe how to approach it. Okay, sounds good. I'll try to keep that in mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, can you see my screen? I know the little pieces available at the top, but. Uh... Yep. All right. Great. Well, then I will get into it. Um, so hi, I'm Isaac Johnson. I'm a research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I'm going to be talking about topic classification for Wikipedia. So this is um, most of my talk is going to be kind of about a supervised version uh, of what um, what was Jordan was discussing previously. Um, it's similar in that it, it's dealing with topics. It's different in the sense that we're using a different set of algorithms. And, and for most of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about the challenge where we know, you know what high level set of topics we are interested in and that's kind of predefined for us. Um, but at the end, I'm gonna kind of discuss some of the overlap um, in, in what I'm talking about and what we're thinking about around Wikipedia and what, and what Jordan presented. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to kind of uh, try to give you an overview of some of the challenges that are shaping our work currently in this space, um, as well as the resources that we've kind of built and that are available for, for use right now and then the you know, future directions we're taking this work. Um, and this is you know, work that I'm going to talk about, um, but it's received a lot of support and in terms of ideas and, and um, research and engineering from Martin Gerlach, uh, Aaron Hafecker, Diego Saez Trumper, um, the growth team, in particular. Or Marshall Miller, as well as many other volunteers. Okay, so first challenge, um, and this is to get at kind of why our topic is important to Wikipedia, um, but Wikipedia is messy. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about some of this uh, beautiful messiness um, uh, and hopefully convince you that modeling topics is important to Wikipedia. Um, so you can't read any of the, the links here, um, but this is a, and this is actually an incomplete um, screenshot of all the links on this page. Um, it's a list that Diego Saez Trumper from our team put together of different Wikipedia uh, and actually Commons as well, um, articles across the different projects that relate to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, so you can see this is just an absolutely massive number of articles that have been created that are kind of related to this topic of, of COVID-19. Um, and this is pretty incredible um, that so much content that is relevant to this topic has been created, uh, but it poses some challenges too. Um, so, you know, just a few. So what if someone creates a new article about the pandemic in their country? Um, how can we automatically route that content to the right subject matter experts? That is, how do we know um, for new content that it should be part of this list, that it's somehow related to this topic that Diego has kind of already um, brought all this content together for? Um, what if you have a new reader in Wikipedia and they, and they want to find kind of relevant content? Uh, that's obviously a huge list of articles and, and there might be things outside this topic that they're interested in. And how do we kind of bring this content to readers? If you've been using Wikipedia for a long time, you, know, you probably know how to kind of navigate and how titles are set up and redirects and you can kind of figure out um, where a content about a particular topic might be. But if you're new, it can be really quite overwhelming and, and kind of difficult at times to find what you're looking for. 
And finally, what if a new editor wants to uh, find kind of relevant articles to which they can contribute? Um, so maybe they're interested in COVID-19 and they know about this list and they can kind of pick their way through it. Um, but if they have other topics they're interested in or, or this list hasn't been created, how do they find um, content that's relevant to their interest easily um, that they can then make contributions to? Um, and these kind of what if questions, um, kind of they're all aiming at this, this general goal of how can we label any Wikipedia article um, with high level topics so that content can be routed to the relevant readers and editors. So uh, kind of do what Diego did with all those COVID-19 articles, um, but for any topic that uh, a reader might be interested in or editor might be interested in. And there's a few kind of potential approaches that you could imagine for this general challenge of organizing all of this content. Um, First is you know the category network. So um, there is a kind of uh, the category network is, is huge. Um, there's about in English Wikipedia alone two million categories, um, but they can be kind of and have been organized into about 43 high level categories um, by editors on Wikipedia. Um, so on the right you can see kind of an image from the page. You know the academic disciplines is one, and you can see how many different subtopics it breaks down to. But then business is another high level topic, and, and so on. Um, and this category network is, is really quite powerful, um, but it's often kind of very messy. There can be cycles in it where you, you go to it through enough subtopics, you end back up at the topic you started with. And so from a kind of computational perspective, it can be very challenging to model. Um, the other challenge, and uh, kind of get back to this, but um, categories tend to kind of over label. Um, so if we're trying to use it to say for a given article, what high level topics is it related to? Um, an example is that for people, um, oftentimes they have topics that say, hey, they're an alumni of such and such college. Um, and if we bring this up to a high level topic, it says, you know, for pretty much any person who went to college, they are somehow related to the education topic. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to kind of balance out um, what are important categories, what are less important categories. And so, that, you know, and this is just kind of a quick look at this. There's actually a presentation from March 2018 um, that was done at this research showcase that goes much more into depth into some of the challenges of working with categories. Um, but for now, kind of, we'll assume that yeah, it's, categories are possible, but they, they're quite messy and difficult to work with as well. So another um, kind of approach that people will bring up for organizing content is uh, in a structured way is the wiki data taxonomy. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I did want to kind of address this. Um, wiki data taxonomy uh, works very well uh, if you're interested in very specific things. So you see on this example, um, the wiki data taxonomy is very nicely kind of modeled that like, oh, you know, planet of the solar system is a category and it has these subcategories of outer planet inner planet and here's the specific pieces that fall under, under that. Um, but it doesn't work so well for high level topics. Um, one kind of, you know, because planet of the solar system is obviously quite specific. Um, but, you know, and attempts have been made to make this more general, but they tend to be incomplete. Um, and the other challenge with Wikidata, and, and we can come back to this if people have more questions, but it's really this taxonomy is designed to organize the knowledge base. Um, and so much of it's kind of not readily interpretable um, by humans, or it doesn't match at least to our expectations. Um, so finally, and this is kind of where I've been leading us, um, another approach to organizing content in Wikipedia is uh, wiki projects. And so these are tend to be um, most salient in English Wikipedia. Um, but for instance, with the COVID-19, a wiki project was started called Wiki Project COVID-19. Um, and it's done a lot of organization. So uh, it's kind of tagged about 300 articles that are related to this pandemic and that, that number is continually growing. Um, it's, you know, there's about a hundred sub and, and, and growing subcategories that it's found to kind of organize some of this content. As part of this wiki project, there's at least 60 participants and there's hundreds of other editors that are kind of contributing to these articles. Um, this has led to like hundreds of talk page discussions. Um, I think the article for the, the main article for the pandemic alone already has like 19 or 20 archived pages of, of talk page discussions. Um, that article also has over 1000 people watching it. Um, so, you know, 
uh, flagging when changes are made to that page. And this content, you know, has gotten one and a half ma million page views per day. So just a massive amount of attention. Um, and this is just English, but there's similar efforts kind of to organize this and, and provide structure and, and make this uh, content high quality, make it discoverable that are happening as well in other languages, as well as uh, Wikimedia Commons, Wikidata, Wikivoyage, Wikivoyage, and so on. And so this is great. I mean, here is a people have come together to kind of uh, bring some structure and organization to uh, to this particular topic and, and give us a way to say, like, if our topic is COVID-19, here's all the content that relates to it. And kind of even better, because COVID-19 is a pretty specific topic, um, there's this wiki project directory. Um, and so here again, editors have said, OK, um, for wiki project, uh, COVID-19, you know, this maybe falls under the general category of STEM and medicine related uh, topics. Um, and so this from this directory, we can pull about 60 of these kind of high level topics. Um, and for each of these topics, we can pull a list of wiki projects that are related to that topic. And, and for our purposes, this tends to be this uh, is pretty good coverage, um, while not being too extensively over labeled. So I'll kind of give you some examples of what this looks like. Um, this is the taxonomy, so from wiki projects. So there's four high level categories, um, culture, geography, history and society, and STEM. And under each of these kind of very high level categories, we have uh, more specific topics. So under culture, we've got biography, and we've got biography of women, we have food and drink, internet culture, and so on. And then for each of these topics, or each of these yeah, high level topics, we have a list of wiki projects that are related. Um, so if you you can't see this, for instance, the earth and environment topic uh, has, it looks about 15 wiki projects that are associated with it. So climate, environment, forestry, meteorology. Um, and then any article that these wiki projects tag, we know relates back to this high level topic of earth and environment. Um, and so, so yeah, so this works very well uh, in practice. We end up with um, being able to relate any given Wikipedia article in English Wikipedia to, uh, to a set of high level topics in this way. And, and kind of through the editor's work, we've got a uh, kind of high level set of topics that we can apply to Wikipedia articles to organize them, make them more, more relevant or um, make them more findable for people. Um, but this raises a second challenge. Um, so what about new content? Um, you know, so a new article is created. Um, the wiki project doesn't know about it, maybe, but no one's tagged it. How do we know uh, where? Uh, how do we know what to do with this article? How do we know what topic it, it might relate to? So we can do the things like routing it to readers or routing it to subject matter matter experts. This is where kind of machine learning uh, comes in. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of a basic setup for this. Um, what we have is 6 million Wikipedia articles in English that uh, are labeled with these wiki project based topics that I was explaining. Um, and from these, we can train a machine learning model that learns to associate the text from these articles with these high level topics like biography or, or STEM. And then what we can do with this model is that we can take any new Wikipedia article, um, we can pass it into the model and it will give us the predictions for what topics it thinks are associated with that text. Um, and so for th from this, for any sort of new content, we can kind of extend the labeling that wiki projects have been doing manually and, and do it uh, automatically by saying, okay, you know, we think these are the topics that would be applied to this article had these wiki, pro you know, had wiki projects come in and, and labeled it as such. Um, and, so, and so we have built this. Um, so the scoring team at Wikipedia kind of uh, specifically has built um, what's called the ORS article topic model. Uh, what it does is it takes in the article text from a Wikipedia article, um, so the words in a Wikipedia article. Um, the, there are models available that can do this in Arabic, Czech, English, Korean, and Vietnamese, so in five different lang uh, languages. And I'm not going to follow this link, but um, you can kind of try out the model yourself through that link. And so just to give you kind of an example of what this looks like, here's the article for Barack Obama. Um, so the ORS model, if you are interested in what topics uh, apply to this, to this article, um, the model would take the text from the article. So not the image, um, but like the text, you know, name born August and so on. And it would take all those words in 
um, and it would output a prediction. And so in this case, this is the prediction that comes from the model, um, which says, oh, this is probably an article about a biography. Um, it seems to be related to North America, and it seems to be related to this politics and government topic as well, um, which are pretty good predictions. And you can also see kind of the um, probabilities for all the other topics that, uh, that didn't meet the threshold for saying this topic probably applies. Okay, great. Um, so we have a model that works in English. And as I said, a few kind of analogous models in other languages, um, but Wikipedia alone has 300 languages. So how do we, how do we get there? So this is kind of our, our next challenge. Um, so one of the uh, approaches that we've started with um, is by making topic prediction, predictions not based on article text, uh, but based on the Wikidata items associated with the article. Um, so this is kind of an experimental Wikidata based model. Um, so again, instead of article text, it's now, it's taking in, in the kind of statements and identifiers that are associated with an article's Wikidata item. Um, and so what that means is that for any given article uh, that has a Wikidata item, which is almost all articles, um, we can make a prediction. We don't need to have a model trained specifically for that language. Um, we can just type, uh, use this Wikidata model to make predictions for any language. Um, so, you know, to continue with this example for Barack Obama, instead of the text about him, uh, we have this kind of structured data that exists in Wikidata. Um, so instance of human, part of the 109th United States Congress, part of the 110th United States Congress, um, part of the Congressional Black Caucus, he has an image and, and so on and so on. Um, so we can treat these as words uh, and then we can get a similar output um, related to the topics that might apply to this Wikidata item. Um, so yeah, again, just to kind of go through this, the training looks very similar, but instead of the article, we're using the Wikidata item. Um, and then the prediction, instead of, again, instead of the article, we use a Wikidata item, but we can get these same predictions out, and then this can apply to any language. Um, so what sorts of kind of further challenges, improvements, uh, and so on do we have in this space? I'm going to close with this brief discussion. Um, all right, so the first one, how do we scale to many languages while still capturing the richness of articles for a language edition? Um, so one of the challenges with this Wikidata model, as you can see, it uses pretty sparse data and it, it's structured. It's kind of very specific to what Wikidata models. Um, it's not anything kind of approaching the richness of what can be written about a topic um, in a language. So how do we kind of find that balance between um, using article text, which is very rich, but also requires a lot of kind of engineering and building a, out of specific models and the simplicity of a Wikidata based model um, but one that, you know, loses a lot of that richness. Um, and this is something that my team is kind of hope, hoping to take on in the next year or so, um, probably by trying to use kind of the links in the article, but use Wikidata as um, kind of the underlying representation to kind of balance out um, language specific modeling with uh, an underlying vocabulary that's based upon Wikidata. Second one is, uh, I think this a uh, really big question for me actually is the English wiki project taxonomy, what, the, what I described earlier, um, is that applicable to other languages? Um, we've done some initial kind of explorations around this. So um, if we use this taxonomy, train the model in English and then you know, uh, apply it to Vietnamese or Arabic, um, do the predictions make sense? Do the high level topics make sense? Um, so we've been doing some work there and I've also uh, done a little bit of work of, you know, trying to understand um, whether the same topics that appear in the English article also appear in other, you know, reasonably appear in other languages or whether other languages, the content is so different that you would really want different topic predictions. And finally, what about more specific topics or topics outside of the taxonomy? So I think this really gets back to what Jordan was uh, kind of describing. Um, you know, we've, I've, what I've been talking about is a very specific, we know we have this set of 60 topics that we want to apply across all of Wikipedia, um, but users might not be interested in those specific topics. They might have topics in mind that they want to, um, that they want to apply, they, they want to find relevant articles um, to. Um, so how do we kind of bridge that gap of supporting those much more kind of custom uh, topic modeling work uh, across a corpus as kind of diverse as Wikipedia is? 
And with that, um, I'll say thank you and uh, hopefully take some questions as well as uh, some discussion with the rest of the room. All right, uh, thank you, Isaac. Uh, so we are at time, but let's take a few questions, uh, essentially by prioritizing uh, our guest, uh, Jordan, and also audiences from IRC and YouTube. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, please go ahead. Um, so I, I guess I could begin by uh, responding uh, to Isaac's uh, 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 comment question uh, from before. Uh, so yeah, the, the underlying problem is that you need to have a mapping from English to other languages. And uh, Wikidata seems like a great way to do that. Um, one suggestion that, that uh, I might make is um, there are multilingual uh, word embeddings um, that map individual words from one language to another. And so for all of the languages uh, I think you mentioned, there, there are good ones out there. So there are multilingual fast text uh, embeddings uh, and wordvectors.org, you could download those. And so there you don't need the underlying entities, you can just use the actual words um, in the articles or uh, whatever resource that you want to look at. Uh, and you could average those. And uh, because that's a little less sparse, that may be a, uh, a more robust way of, of doing this mapping across languages. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's actually something we've already started to look into a little bit. Um, the, it's yeah, we've been, you know, so it is a really good solution. I think we've found for some of like, uh, I've looked at English, Russian and Hindi. Um, and we found pretty good mapping there. Um, yeah, I guess I wonder for some of the, like as we move towards even lower resource languages that wouldn't have these um, embeddings kind of uh, how to extend to the, their well as well as like hiccups, if you will, that might appear in the process. Yeah, um, so I, I, right, and, and <laughs> there, there was a great uh, DARPA program called Lorelei on low resource languages. And so uh, part of, that project is like to, to try this out in as many languages as possible. And, and so as long as you have on the order of 5 million tokens uh, in, in the language to work with, um, that, that's, that's kind of a good heuristic for you. You can probably get a good multilingual word embedding out of that. Cool, thank you. Yeah, but a, a, a great talk, really exciting work and uh, uh, good luck. We have one question from uh, YouTube. Uh, Husamid in Turkey asks, uh, I ask if Wikidata taxonomy has been pre-processed. Pre I'm sure that it should be trimmed by removing useless instance of relations. There's also the problem of cold start for machine learning. Uh, so I think that that's more of a, yeah, a, a, a probe uh, into some of the methods to get you to talk a little bit about that. Could you say something about that, Isaac? Yeah, yeah. I played around a little bit with the um, Wikidata taxonomy. Um, so I think a couple challenges come out of that. Um, one is you're right that like some trimming helps a lot, but it it's fast. Uh, and so it's very hard to kind of do all the trimming that you need to do. Um, and it's very hard to kind of know automatically where to stop. So like with the example where I showed of um, like Jupiter is, or I'm gonna, uh, Earth is an uh, instance of like an inner planet in the solar system, right? Um, so you have inner planet in the solar system. So, okay, that's too too specific. We wanna kind of aggregate that up. Um, so you say, okay, planet in the solar system, still too specific aggregate. And you keep going, you will get to like astronomical entity, um, which is like, okay, maybe, but you might say like, ah, even that, it's like, you know, if we astronomical and, and then, you know, really want something like physics or space or something, right? Like something broader. Um, but the next step up from that is something like first level uh, meta class or something like it essentially transitions very quickly from uh, something that's kind of human interpretable to something that's much more about kind of modeling um, yeah, like modeling this uh, this knowledge base. Um, so it gets very hard to know exactly when to stop um, and, and still have topics that are interpretable while um, not having like a, you know, thousands upon thousands of topics that, that you might, uh, that you might include or that you might keep. 
that's a challenge that I ran into. I mean, I think it's still worth uh, investigating for a lot of things. Um, I'll also say the other challenge it has for things like COVID-19, um, for instance, like people, there's plenty of people who are related to this epidemic and you said, give me the content related to COVID-19. Um, you're gonna wanna hear about, you know, the doctors who are kind of part of that. Um, but the instance of taxonomy is gonna kind of capture that they're people, it'll maybe capture that generally their doctors are working in medicine, um, but it's very hard because it's not set up for this to capture that they're relate. The reason that this person is salient is because they're related to this topic of the pandemic. Um, so it, it, get, it becomes challenging to use Wikidata in, in cases like that as well. Thank you, Isaac. No other questions from YouTube or IRC, Jalal. All right, uh, so with this, uh, let me close out the March showcase. Uh, first, by thanking our speakers, Jordan uh, Boygrabber and Isaac Johnson. Um, also to everybody in the audience, uh, who took the time to join us in these difficult times. Uh, thanks again for everybody. Uh, have a great rest of the day and stay safe out there. Bye. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Jordan. Well, wonderfully done.